Well, good morning again and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So, uh, you got your science hats on today? Because we're going to cover a little bit of math and a little bit of physics. Okay? We're not going to get out of control. <clears throat> this isn't my lecture series on, uh, on mathematical physics. It is just to give you an idea of how God plays a role in all of the natural things that we see going on in our lives. The Big Bang Theory, um, actually what's interesting about that is that, well, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you know where that theory came from? Do you know who initially proposed the Big, the Big Bang Theory? And, and basically what it says is that the universe was created, if you will, from an ultra-high mass density of a point that is immeasurably small and that it just sort of exploded and everything that we see today is a result of that. It's supposedly about 13.7 billion years ago. Actually, it's 13 billion, 700 million and three days ago because I read that three days ago. So it's a little older now than it was when I first read it. Um, but, but do you know where this idea of the Big Bang Theory came from? Anybody know? Well, Darwin? No? You'd think it would have been from some atheist somewhere that would have tried to explain away God. But the Big Bang Theory actually was from a guy by the name of uh, Georges Lemaitre. He was a Belgium monk, a uh, Catholic monk. And he came up with this theory back in the early 30s, I think 31 or uh, 32 or something like that. Anyway, it was against all of uh, uh, the teachings. The atheists actually hated the idea that he came up with this concept because it, he used it to describe how God had sort of created all this. This is where it came from. And look at where we are today where it's done a complete reversal. Christians tend to be opposed to that concept. Whoops. Christians, we're going to have this again today, aren't we, all day, um, where they tend to be opposed to that concept, but in fact it is, um, um, it is the, um, um, the atheists that, that tend to support it uh, nowadays. So we're going to talk a little bit about this, the reading for today, uh, if this ever comes back up you can follow with me, it is Revelation uh, 14, 6 and 7, and it says, Wait, let me reconnect. Sorry, guys. It's become a regular problem, hasn't it, this whole connection thing? Hold on. Reconnected. All right. Revelation 14, 6, and 7. This is part of the three angels' message. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, what? Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So from this theory of the Big Bang Theory of evolution comes the theory of relativity. Now, the theory of relativity, I'm just going to read these two. This is, by the way, first proposed by Galileo. And the core idea of both special and general theories of relativity is that two observers, right, me and Mark, um, who move relative to each other, we're walking along past each other in the street, we measure different time and space intervals for that same event, right, us passing each other. But the content, the component of that physical law is observed the same by both. And in essence, what it's saying is, is, that, um, is that as Mark and I observe an event, that we may observe it relative to our position and our movement as to the time. It's kind of like this idea. Uh, you know how people say, uh, as I get older, time seems to go faster and faster. You ever heard that? It's actually kind of true in a way. When you're one years old and you become two years old, that is a 100% change in your age. That's a big deal. When you're my age and you get a birthday, it's like a 1.6% change. 
And so that is a much smaller change. And so year to year, as I age from year to year, the difference is so significantly smaller than when I was younger that that is part of this concept of relativity. It took 65 years for me to get where I am today, and it feels like it was just like that. And I know that if I make it to the age of 66, that it's going to feel the same way. So the theory of relativity applies only to large bodies, the universe, planets, things like that. Okay, So that's what that concept is about. But that wasn't good enough. And, and scientists felt that they had to explain what happens at a smaller level, at a more uh, molecular level or atomic level, if you will. So then they get into something called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is interesting. So I take my hand, and uh, how, many, how, many, how many fingers do I have here? Okay, and I put my hand here. How many fingers do I have? But you don't know that because you can't see it. So you're, you're basing that on what you just saw and sort of on a faith concept. So as long as I keep my hand covered, quantum mechanics basically says that there is no way to know what the truth is until you have a representation of it. But quantum mechanics only exists within the most microscopic of worlds. It's a fundamental physical theory, just like relativity. It replaces this idea of Newtonian mechanics, right, and classic electromagnetism because it talks about gravity. There's a particle called the gravitron, which is responsible for gravity, but have they ever seen it? No, we can't see it because it's too small of a particle. Uh, the term quantum refers to the discrete units that the theory assigns to certain physical quantities. I'm just going to read this. I don't care if we understand it. But the basic foundations were established during the first half of the 20th century. And we can thank brilliant uh, physicists like Max Planck and Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, um, uh, uh, Max Born, John Van Neumann, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, and others that contributed to this idea of the theory. But here's what I would tell you. Have you ever had a, con a conversation with someone who's wanted to talk about quantum theory or quantum mechanics? Have you ever had that conversation? Oh, you've missed out. It's just an amazing conversation. Here's what I can tell you. I have, unfortunately, at some of these conferences that I go to. And I have people who say, yeah, I understand. I actually know how this works. I understand it. Well, they're lying. Because nobody understands the concept of quantum mechanics. Why? Because we can't see the particles. We can't measure the impact or the effect of it. Right? We can't. Basically, it's like this. Relativity says we try to measure the movement of the planets and the structure of the space-time continuum. Right? The, the, is, is it curved due to gravity? All those kind of cool ideas. Light, when light passes by a black hole, does it curve because of the gravity of the black hole pulls it in? And you know, we just we do our best to try and understand those uh, types of concepts. But in quantum mechanics, we want to study, for example, the speed and movement of a proton. So how do you have to do it? You have to get really, really close to it to measure it. Well, the closer you get to it, the more it changes the the speed and the motion of it. So so you can't ever get to that point. At least we haven't been able to do that today with our ability to measure these things. I don't want to belabor this. But what we have is what's called this polar opposition. And what the polar opposition basically says is that there is no theory that combines general and special relativity and quantum mechanics. And physics are freaking out over it because they have this absolute need to know the answer to all of this. And they want what's called the theory of everything. Do we know what the theory of everything is? 42. What is it? 42. What's that? Never mind. Thank you. We don't know the answer to it, except that God is the answer because God solves the problem of the theory of everything. And I'm going to explain this to you as we come along through this. What it basically says is that you can't extrapolate or you can't infer simultaneously quantum mechanics on the most microscopic of levels and relativity on the largest of levels because it doesn't work. And this is what physicists have, instead of studying the word of God, this is what they spend their time trying to discover. Um, Psalm, oh, it's in the next slide, I'm sorry. Okay, so what happens? The Big Bang Theory doesn't work anymore. 
We can't find this answer that we want to everything. So what does a scientist do if what they're studying doesn't work? They come up with a new theory. And now they have what's called the superstring theory. Okay? The superstring theory basically says, for the most part, that the fundamental constituents are not these little tiny atoms and protons that make everything up, but they're little strings. They're like little rubber bands. And they're at what's called the Planck length. And the Planck length, as you can see, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters. The problem is we can only measure to about 1 times 10 to the minus 32 meters. So we actually can't see these little resonant strings because they're too small. So it's just a theory that we, I have a different theory. I don't think it's rubber bands. I think that it's really little thumbtacks. But the little thumbtacks are so small that we can't measure those thumbtacks. And I'm probably just as right as everybody else is. And for super string theory to be true, there has to be at least a minimum of 11 different dimensions mathematically for it to occur. Same problem. We don't have the technology to measure or see something that small. And Psalms 33.9 says, for when he spoke, Bang! That, I put that in, by the way. That's not actually in the Bible. The world began. It appeared at his command. Here's what I love about super string theory. What it says is that at the frequency with which those little microscopic strings or rubber bands vibrate determines the physical composition or makeup of something. And Yolanda talked about it during the children's story. How was the earth created? How was the universe put into place? Did God mold it with his hands? What did he do? <sighs> if that doesn't convince a physicist who believes in superstring theory that there is a God, then they are denser than the fabric of space. Because if you really believe that the entire universe is made up of these small, vibrating, resonant strings, and the God spoke and the resonance from his voice ordered and organized all of these countless number of immeasurable strings and rubber bands and they resonated with his voice and from that became the universe. I'm so excited about super string theory because I believe that that is the closest thing we've come to being able to describe how God formed or spoke into existence the universe. Isn't that the coolest thing in the world? You know, some people believe this is when time began. We talked about this last week a little bit. When we talk about uh, eternity, no beginning and no end, that the Godhead has been here for, forever. There is no beginning and end to it. What we talk about eternity being is before time. Well, people are like, how could there be a before time? Well, it's not for our little human brains to figure out, right? We read it in the Bible last week and in Miss White's writings that we have finite understanding and we are simply not able to understand the mysteries of God. That's just the way it is. Remember, that's what happened to Eve. Uh, Lucifer came and said, hey, would you like to know everything God knows? All you have to do is disobey and eat this fruit. And some people believe that actually is when time began. We talked about it. How long were Adam and Eve in the garden? before Eve sinned? We don't know. And maybe it's because there was no time until she sinned. Because then we know when she had her first child, she's what, 125 years old? Can you imagine that, ladies? I would not want to live like to be 900 years old like they were. I'd hate to be 416 years old and out looking for a job. I mean, it's hard enough now as it is. So, my question is this. If the Bible doesn't say when it began, should we spend all of our time focusing on it? It's like what we do with Christmas. I'm not going to Christmas bash here. But when was Jesus born? When, the Bible, when does the Bible say that Jesus' birthday is? Does it say December 25th anywhere in the Bible? Yet that's what we focus on and celebrate when we don't have a clue what it is. And I'm just saying that if it's not in the Bible, let's not focus on it. On, and become fixated on those things. So I want to tell you a story, what happened to me. I walked in, I was in a Publix one time in the grocery store, and I was in line getting ready to check out, and there was a guy behind me in line, and I turned, and he had this hat on, One Nation, No God. I'd never seen that before, but that's the hat that he had on. And I was staring at it, 
because I don't really have much in the way of social manners or I don't do well with social cues. So I'm just like this. <laughs> and he finally said, is there a problem? And I didn't want to be beat up or anything. And I said, no, I'm really sorry. I've just never seen a hat like that before. And he took it off and he looked at it and he put it back on. And he said, yep, one nation, no God. I said, you really believe that? He said, yeah. He said, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I am. And he said, so you believe that there is a God? And I said, well, yeah, absolutely I do. And he said to me, can you prove it? I said, well, no. Or can you prove there isn't a God? And he said, well, no. I said, so you know what you and I share? Faith. I have faith there is a God. You have faith there isn't a God. That's all it's about. It's what we choose to believe. Now, faith, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things what? Yeah. Not seen. In heavenly places, 51, uh, paragraph 4, Ellen White writes this. He says, with its justifying, sanctifying power, it, and I put the faith in, is above what men call science. Above what men call science. It is the science of eternal realities. Human science is often deceptive and misleading. Have we found that to be true? You know, it's funny, I'm, I'm not going to delve into the politics of it, but the whole COVID thing over the last year, year and a half, and this thing about wearing masks and not wearing masks and wearing 10 masks and wearing no masks and, and all that. And, and I, I was talking to someone about it once and I said, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not wearing a mask if I don't have to wear a mask. And, blah, blah. and they said, oh, you don't believe in science? I said, yeah, I believe in science. I don't believe in scientists. Because science is a natural law. It's part of the natural laws that God put into place. Scientists are human beings who try to interpret what God has provided to us. She says it's so simple that a child may understand it, and yet the most learned men cannot explain it. It is unexplainable and immeasurable beyond all human expression. Romans 1, 21 to 23 says, Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. Does that sound familiar? When we talk about trying to explain how the world, how the universe came into existence? Because we don't have evidence anywhere on it. It says, as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. I don't know about you, but I like to know things. I like to have answers. I like to know everything. I cry out for wisdom and understanding. That's what I cry out for. But it's not human wisdom, and it's not human understanding. And this comes from Psalms 2, 2-8. to eight. Listen to this. This is from Solomon, the most brilliant man, the wisest man that ever walked on the face of the earth. He says, my child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding cry out for insight and ask for understanding we should be crying out to god to give us wisdom and understanding so that we can carry the gospel message to other people search for them as you would for silver seek them like hidden treasures then you will understand what it means to fear the lord and you will gain knowledge of god for the lord grants wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the paths of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. So let's talk about, instead of the theory of relativity, how we understand it from human perspectives, let's talk about a spiritual principle of this relativity. And what I'm talking about is the great unification theory, which is the theory of everything okay remember relativity is the word um, uh, for how things only have importance in relation to other things right it refers to Einstein's theory it doesn't refer to God because we have absolute truth from God and absolute guidance from God and absolute laws from God the laws of God this is the amazing part are the same for all observers so if Mark and I are if he's on a train traveling by the station and I'm in the station and I see Mark, he goes flying by me at 
40 or 50 miles per hour, but for Mark, inside the train, he's not moving at all. It's relative to our position. But that's not true with God's laws. To Mark and I, the Ten Commandments are absolute. It doesn't say that there's some relative reason you can violate a commandment. Now, people do it, and I understand that. It's still sin. Maybe we don't know it. God says if you sin and you don't know it's sin, it's still sin, but I don't account it to you until you become aware, educated, until you've heard my voice and learn what the truth is. But in this grand unification theory for us, it means that the laws of God, that the truth of God is the same for everybody, even though you may not recognize it. If you don't believe there's a God, you're wrong. But whatever. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Not everyone is entitled to be right. In God's Amazing Grace, Ms. White writes this. She says, God loves his creatures with a love that is both tender and strong. He, who? God, has established the laws of nature, but his laws are not arbitrary exactions. Every thou shalt not, whether in physical or moral law, contains or implies a promise. Here, here's one. Thou shalt not drive your car at 60 miles an hour into a cement embankment. Why is that? Because gravity is not your friend. Inertia is not your friend, right? Um, uh, kinetic energy isn't your friend if you're driving a vehicle into a solid object. That is a law that doesn't have an arbitrary exaction. If it is obeyed, Blessings will attend our steps. If it is disobeyed, the result is danger and unhappiness. Um, I used to skydive a lot. I probably got 600 jumps. And here's what I know. If I don't pull the chute, gravity will work against me. There are consequences to challenging the laws of nature. The laws of God are designed to bring his people closer to himself. He will save them from the evil and lead them to the good if they will be led. But force them, he never will. The spiritual principle of relativity applies at all levels of reality. It's no longer relative. It is, in fact, absolute. So here's what I think we have. I think what we have is everyone I've ever known in my life is searching for the foundational uh, truth. Everyone. Do you know anyone who's not searching for the truth somewhere, even in their own way, whether it's religious or through spiritual means, or physical means, or worldly means. I think, everybody, I think everybody has this innate, inherent need to find the truth for them. Did God create us, or do we create God? And I think that's a question we have to contemplate. I first heard that question asked sitting around a table at lunch, at a conference I went to for the American Statistical Association. And in this, in this table, there was a guy there who was a, a mathematical physicist. And we were talking a little bit about some of these dimensional, multi-dimensional theories that go on for superstring theory. And, um, and he said, you know, I, I often wondered about this question. And he was a Christian. He said, Do, did, we create, did God create us or like at this conference, are we trying to create God in our own image? And people do that all the time. Again, we talked about it 13 billion, 700 million and three days ago, uh, the earth was created. You heard the joke, the guy went to the Grand Canyon and uh, he comes back and his family says, oh, how was it? He said, it was great. Do you know the Grand Canyon was created two billion years ago? And they said, really? He said, well, actually two billion years and three days ago because I was there three days ago, they told me that. Same thing, same thing. Susan and I were out west one time, we're driving along the road, and there's a sign on the side of this rock face, and it says, uh, 637 million years old. And then we drove a mile, and it said 287 million years old. And I'm like, how could there be 400 million years of difference between that mile uh, that we just drove? I don't believe any of it. Part of the problem that we run into in this Big Bang Theory is there's something called uh, the Planck moment. It's, uh, so we have this, um, this infinitely small point, like a, the, 
the sharp point of a pin, which contains all the mass of the entire universe in that little point, and all the energy. My mind, I, I just don't have a big enough brain to get my head around that, actually. And then it explodes. And then it expands. It continues to expand. And there we have, now we have uh, the universe. The problem is, is that in the first 10 to the minus 33 seconds of that explosion, no physicist or scientist can explain what happens. So between the time that the detonation occurs and the universe pops out, I guess, nobody can explain what happened during that time. And that's one of the, one of the reasons that, we, that scientists went into this superstring theory. The problem is not everyone's searching for the truth, but people are searching for an understanding of what they think the truth might be. John 8, 31 and 32 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, who believed him. So let me caveat this. If you don't believe Jesus, then probably none of this is going to be of any value to you at all. He said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know what? The truth. And the truth will? I don't know about you, but I don't like being a hostage. I don't like being a hostage to my brain. I don't like lying down at night and I can't shut my head up. The committees just continue to meet, and I feel like a hostage to those thoughts that I have. That's what I love about Sabbath is God blesses me, and my head quiets down, and I actually usually sleep pretty well on, on Friday nights. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12 says, And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. For what reason? Do you remember this verse prior to this? Because they don't believe in God. They don't abide in, they don't believe in Jesus. And so what they do is they, they want miracles. They want magic to happen, right? It's just like, you know, the Jews said, we want a king. And God said, there's a bad idea. And they said, well, that's your opinion. We still want a king. And he's like, whatever, here's your king. And boy, that was something that we regretted for years and years, right? And it says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. And they, may, they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in, in, right, in unrighteousness. It goes on to say they did not receive the love of the truth. You know, in these final days, we're going to see miracles but they're not going to be from God. He's going to allow Satan to do this because that's what people were asking for. Just like they asked for a king, they're asking for magic, and he's going to allow that magic to occur. So I'm not going to dwell on it because we've talked about it in many other sermons, but we have to be aware of false teachers, people that will come out. I'm not talking about a scientist who's studying superstring theory and who's saying, you know, we believe this might be one of the ways because it's possible. I don't know how God created the universe. I don't know what these smallest components are. Maybe they are thumbtacks or rubber bands or something. I don't know. It's not important to me right now because it doesn't change my relationship with Christ. But who knows that that's not what they're studying. That's fine. But I'm talking about the ones that are doing that and saying there is no God. This is in place of God. And that's the false teaching that goes on. <clears throat> in Christian education, um, the inspired writings from Ellen White say this. Many teach that matter possesses vital power, that certain properties are imparted to matter, and it is then left to act though its own, through its own inherent energy. So in essence, what they're saying is that matter has its own energy. It doesn't come from some other source, like from God. And that the operations of nature are conducted in harmony with fixed laws with which God himself cannot interfere. That's just impossible, guys. I'm going to show you that in just a minute, that, that God can't interfere with natural laws. This is false science and is not sustained by the word of God. Nature is the servant of her creator. You know, I always marvel at that idea about people challenging that there is a creator. Let me ask you something. We're inside this church. This is part of this big strip mall that we have here, right? Um, do you believe that someone created this, built this? How do you know? Were you here when they did it? Did you watch somebody build this building? Then how do you know that somebody built it? How do you know it just didn't appear out of nowhere? There was an explosion somewhere, and you open your eyes, and 10 to the minus 32 seconds later, 
we have this building that we're meeting in. How do you know? One of the only ways we can even begin to imagine that is that we're here. The building is here, right? So for the building to be here, there has to be a creator of the building. And we are here. There had to be something that created it. I, I just don't get why it's so hard. Why do we take something that's so beautiful and so simple and we turn it into something so dark and so confusing? She so says, God does not annul his laws or work contrary to them, but he is continually using them as his instruments. Nature testifies because we're here. Nature testifies of an intelligence, a presence, an active energy that works in and through her laws. There is in nature the continual working of the Father and the Son. John 5, 17, I love this verse. Jesus replied, my Father constantly does good, and I am following his example. I want you to remember that God is the creator of the physical laws. And just, these are some of my favorite examples. 2 Kings 20, 11. Remember, this is where Hezekiah was sick, and, he's, and the prophet Elijah came, or Isaiah came to him, and he said, uh, uh, God is, you know, he, he, uh, um, Hezekiah asked Isaiah to go to God and asked him to give him more time. He had like a big boil or an infection or something like that. And he was going to die from it, bless you. And so Isaiah goes and he pleads to the Lord for Hezekiah's life. And the Lord says, uh, yep, yep, I'm going to, um, I'm going to grant Hezekiah another 10 years. And he goes to Hezekiah and said, hey, you're really really blessed because God has agreed to fix this problem and you're going to live even longer. And what do you think, what would you say? Thank you. You'd say thank you. What did Hezekiah say? Oh, prove it. I want a sign. I want, a sign. I want God to prove to me that that's really what he's going to do. And Isaiah's like, what are you talking about? So he goes back to God and he says, sorry about this. I hate to be the one to bring you the message, but Hezekiah wants a sign. And God says, well, go back and tell him this. I'll either move the sundial backwards 10 degrees or forward 10 degrees. That's 40 minutes on the sundial. So basically what he said to, to Isaiah to tell Hezekiah, I'll agree to move time forward or backwards for you. Basically advance the universe or decline the universe. Hezekiah says, um, well, <laughs> it's amazing anyone would say this. But he said, well, I mean, the time goes forward anyway, so that's probably not hard for God. <laughs> Imagine that. So what I'm going to tell you guys is now the sermon's over because I just advanced time 10 minutes. And you're going, I hope it's over in 10 minutes, right? I advanced time 10 minutes. And is that, that's, is that easy? That's impossible. But Hezekiah says, can't be too hard to move time forward because that's kind of how it works anyway. Move it backwards. So God moved the shadow back 10 degrees. God reversed time by 40 minutes in the universe. It's, I don't know what to say. My brain's going to blow up right now. There's going to be stuff everywhere. How about this one? Now when he had said these things, he cried out in loud voices after Lazarus had been dead for how long? Three days. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died, he wasn't just died, by the way. Rigor mortis set in. They had already bound him up with bandages. They had uh, embalmed him, did all the things that they do. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Remember uh, Elijah? Uh, the kid was out there chopping down the trees. He had borrowed this axe from somebody. When he came back, the axe had flew off and into the middle of the river. And the river was at high run. And he's freaking out. Oh, man, he said, I'm done. I can't afford to pay for that. What am I going to do? And Elisha said a prayer. And what happened to the axe head? Floated. An axe head. Right? Archimedes' principle. Go look it up. Google it today. Archimedes' principle. And look at how displacement of an object in water causes it to float or to sink. Do you know how many miracles there are in the Bible? I counted. I had nothing to do. So I figured I'd check it out. I found 83 in the Old Testament, 
and 81 in the New Testament. So that's a total of 164 miracles. I may be wrong, there may be more, but those are at least the ones that I was able to find throughout the Bible. It's Christ and Christ alone. Uh, Ellen White, um, she writes this, I can't remember where it was. It was in Acts of the Apostles. And she said basically that, um, that Paul, when he was out preaching, had to adapt his style to the character of his audience. Remember that? And he said, um, uh, I was preaching logic to the logisticians and science to the scientists and philosophy to the philosophers and math to the mathematicians. And then he, he thought about all this and he said, I didn't make much progress with this at all. And, and then he adopted this new idea. I don't know nothing about that. Bless you. All I know is about Jesus Christ. And this is what 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5 talks about this. It says, when I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. He, he preached to the character and the style of the people first, but he wasn't having much success. And he said, wait a minute. Maybe I need to stop preaching science and math and philosophy and I just need to pre preach Jesus Christ and he did that and it all changed for him in closing Doris truth and wisdom only come from God we might think that we've invented some new science thing we haven't we've just God has just allowed us to discover something that he put out there for us. It's the natural laws. They're here. God created them. They are not random. They are not chaotic. They are ordered. I'll close with this. This is from Christ Object Lessons 22, um, paragraph 2. It says, in the Savior's parable, teaching is an indication of what constitutes the true higher education. Christ might have opened, now listen, he might have opened to men the deepest truths of science so that we wouldn't be guessing about how the world was formed, we would know that. He might have unlocked mysteries which have required many centuries of toil and study to penetrate. Maybe now we would have the solution to Riemann's functional equation from the 1700s that identifies the exact precise location of every prime and prime pair to infinity. But he didn't. He might have made suggestions in scientific lines that would have afforded food for thought and stimulus for invention to the close of time. But he did not do this. He said nothing to gratify, gratify curiosity or to satisfy man's ambitions by opening doors to worldly greatness. In all his teaching, Christ brought the mind of man in contact with the infinite mind. He did not direct the people to study men's theories about God, his word, or his works. He taught them to behold him as manifested in his works, in his word, and by his providences. Is that amazing? You know, Andrew Wiles, he's a brilliant mathematician, and, uh, he was at Oxford for some time. He, he uh, actually, I think he runs the math, um, uh, advanced mathematics department at Princeton now. Uh, Andy Wiles solved for, um, um, oh my gosh, um, I just forgot it. And, and now I'm embarrassed that I could even forget it. He solved the equation for Pythagorean's theorem. I'm so sorry. He found a proof for Pythagorean's theorem that says a squared plus b squared equals c squared on a right triangle. The question is, could it be a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed, or a to the 20th plus b to the 20th equals c to the 20th? And he solved that problem. And he became famous, and he got a million dollars for it because it's one of the millennial problems. Here, we're being told that that's not what God's intention was, that we could go out and find worldly greatness for solving the, the mysteries of science and nature. That's not what this was about. Praise God that he gave us this beautiful world, this nature to enjoy and to be part of. So instead of trying to figure out what should we, enjoy, what should we do, just enjoy it and praise God and use it to build our faith. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Well, I got a challenge for you. 
You know, um, the last few weeks where, I, where we live up in Spring Hill, there's been a peacock around. And um, um, on Tuesday, uh, I hear him all the time around our property. Tuesday, I saw him. And he walked through the property in the back. So I got a little corn and I threw it out there. I got it from the pigeon guy. And now he's kind of hanging out there. And, and he's really loud, I'll admit that. Yeah, but it's a beautiful cry that he makes, right? And, and he's gorgeous. He's got this massive tail. And, um, um, and I, I just love it, you know? And, and my challenge is stop fighting nature. It's hot. It's humid. It's not always comfortable. Take a deep breath and stop fighting it because it only makes it worse. Let's just go with it. Let's be part of what God has created for us. If it's hot, then you're hot. You're going to be fine. If it rains and you get wet, guess what happens later? You dry. That's right. That's just sort of the nature of it. I love to be outside. I sleep in my hammock during the day. I take a nap. It's hot and I sweat, but it's okay. So I want you to spend this week just trying to engage more in sort of the natural process of things. Everything thing that's in nature, I want you to praise God. I want you to see God in it and, and, and just glorify him because it's not always pretty what we have here, but it's what we got until we leave. So let's take advantage of it and do our best to enjoy it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, we'll close in our usual manner. Yivrecha Adonai v'yishmarecha ya'ar Adonai panavalecha v'ikunecha Yisau Adonai panavalecha v'yashamlecha shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So wait, wait. There you go.